We did it! We are finally here at chapter 3 of the contact course. So far we've sampled some sounds and built an instrument, but now it's time to hoodie up and channel our inner programmer because we're diving into scripting. Hey, my name is Steve, composer, engineer, and lecturer, and welcome back to the channel. We've already seen how sampling can make some amazing, extraordinary sounds, and how to put those into context so that we can play them back at any time. If you've missed those chapters, chapters one and two, dive down into the description for the full playlist of the whole course. And of course, if you're loving this tutorial series, why not subscribe and follow along? Now that we've made our instrument, we want to script a basic interface so that we can change settings on the fly easily from the front screen. This is what's known as performance view, and today's video, we're going to dive in and start creating that. Let's check it out. Okay, so let's remind ourselves of what we got so far. So far, we've got this instrument, Folon, and it's been developed by a few groups. We've got our bells sounds, our pluck sounds, and some of our pad sounds. And we've got a few effects in here as well. So we've got a low pass filter that we're going to play around with in this chapter, and some reverb as well. Let's have a little play, see what it sounds like. The hard work from chapter one and two, I feel like it's paid off a little bit and it's starting to sound a little bit cool. Now though, we want to script something that is easy to use and powerful from the front screen, a visual representation of some of the program features that we've been using so far. So when we look in here, we've got things like down here, our low pass filter, and we can adjust the cutoff there if we want to. We've got settings within our reverb, such as the balance of the amount of reverb that's coming back. All of these things are kind of buried in the settings and we don't really want to have to dive in here every single time. So we definitely want to map some of these controls over to a visual GUI. And that will take place on the front screen without any of that behind the scenes stuff being seen. So if you remember back to chapter one, I had a little bit of a sketch, a little bit of a design of how I wanted it to look. Let's dive in and take a look at how I created that. So this is the design that I came up with, a very simple gradient type inspired design, nothing too flash. It has three sections to it, which is gonna have my layers, which are gonna be some sliders here. It's gonna have some envelope settings, so attack, decay, that sort of thing. And we're gonna have some effects as well maybe some reverb and the low pass filter being controlled by here. That'll be great. I've created this easily within Affinity Designer, but there are a number of programs that can do it. You could do things like Photoshop, of course. Adobe Photoshop is still hugely popular and is the kind of gold standard of uh, editing things. Or you could do it, of course, in Illustrator. I'm sure there are plenty more options out there. Those are the ones that I can think of off the top of my head. The main thing you're looking for, though, is something that can create graphics to pixels. When we have a look here, I've got a set pixel height of 300 and a width of a thousand. Now it is really important that we stay under 818 pixels high and a thousand pixels wide because that in contact six is the maximum size that our interface can be. If you're wondering why that number is a little bit odd for the height, 818, what it actually is, is 75 plus 68 on top. The 68 is actually this part here. It's the header of the instrument and then there will be 750 further down, and of course a thousand wide. Now really quickly, it's worth me mentioning that there are some titles here, and that's because these are gonna be sliders and sliders don't have their own titles. This will make more sense in future videos as we start to add these sliders in and start to add some functionality, but that's what they are. They're essentially labels, and I'm gonna be putting controls over the top of this interface and a bunch of knobs here, for example, and buttons and all sorts. It can be a good idea to bake your titles onto the background, and then that way all you have to do is just drop the control wherever you want it. So when you're designing your library, think about that and maybe think about what you want on your background and what you wanna to leave till later to script in, but it'll make more sense as we look through the next videos in this chapter. So with my graphic created, now I want to export it and I want to export it as a PNG file. That's the file that Contact is going to be looking for. Once you have that saved, you'll be able to come into your instrument and add that in as a background. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to come into my instrument, into my spanner, and I want to dive into instrument options. There is a really easy way to add an instrument wallpaper from here. There is a more complicated scripting way, but for now we're just going to upload a simple image because that's usually enough to get you up and running. And it will definitely work for if you're wanting to share this library or store it for yourself later. Okay, so I'd open it up, of course, and then you want to navigate to where you have stored that file. So you can see my folon underscore background dot PNG. So that PNG file, making sure it's the right format for contact. And then I'd simply click open 
and close that. Then what you can do is hit the spanner and see if your background is there, but it won't quite be visible yet. If I hit that spanner there, you'll see that the background has now changed and we can see some of that background gradient happening there. So I know that something's there, but it's not taking up the space. That's because at the moment we haven't created what's known as a performance view or our GUI, our graphic user interface. We haven't actually created one yet. So the background is just stopping after it reaches the end of the header because there's no more space to fill up. Let's dive in and take a look at that. This is where scripting starts to become involved. And we're gonna start using our script editor to do this. The script editor is available as one of these tabs. So I'm just gonna close this group editor and open up the script editor instead. There are five slots to our script editor. And most of the time, by default, you wanna put your script for your GUI in the last one. That's because each one of these slots can do something different and they could actually do things like arpeggiators or harmonizers and chord playback. All of that you probably wanna put before your interface because these are in series. So if one is before the other, it will appear in the next one or can be affected by the next one. So you want all of those controls to be affected in your GUI so you can add any one of those controls from any one of these scripts in your GUI later. We're gonna be only using one script. We're not gonna be using any of the other scripts, but it's a good practice to be in just to put that script at the end. That way, if you ever get involved with arpeggiators or harmonizers later on, you'll be ready and you'll know the process. Okay, so I wanna jump in here and hit edit. This is where I'm gonna be putting my code. Now, a little bit of basics around coding. If you haven't done coding before, this could seem like gobbledygook and all completely new language to you. And it certainly did to me the first time I kind of dived into here. I'd had some little experience with coding before, but nothing sort of to this extent. Here are a few basic things to know. The first thing is that contact does everything inside a series of callbacks. The callbacks are events, sort of events that happen. And the first one that we're going to be using is the on initialization or the on init callback. Essentially in here, I'm going to type on in it, and then every callback, which this is starting the callback, is gonna end with an on, so go end on. So that way, basically, we have the callback that's gonna happen, which means on initialization, and then it's gonna say end on, and whatever happens between here is gonna happen as soon as the instrument is initialized, or, or started, essentially. Let's give myself a little bit of space to work with. And I'm gonna tab over. These tabs don't offer anything extra or anything changed. Essentially, the tabbing is just a good way of kind of organizing your code. Every time you do something new or you've got something enclosed in something else, it's good to tab it over. It just makes your code a little bit easier to read. In this section here, we want to make a performance view. So what I'm gonna do is go make underscore perf view. And then when I hit apply, that applies the script. So it's a very basic script at the moment with a single command, which is to make a performance view. But now if I hit the spanner, we can start to see our background coming in here. We've got a performance view of some kind. Nothing special at the moment, and it's still certainly hidden, but there's something happening. This is exciting. This is the first line of code, your first command in your first callback. But let's expand it because now what we wanna do is change the height and the width. So the next thing we're gonna do is we come down here, tab over, I'm gonna do set underscore UI underscore height underscore pixels. There are two methods of spacing within contact. One is pixels and one is grid. I would recommend getting used to pixels because you're gonna be designing your background in pixels. And later on, if you start designing your own custom knobs and sliders and other kinds of graphics, you're gonna to want to be used to working in pixels. The grid system is basically like contact dividing up its space into grids and you can move it to you know, grid line one, two or three or whatever. But as soon as you do anything in pixels, it changes everything over to pixels. So it's definitely worthwhile getting used to pixels rather than grid. So in here, I'm gonna put 300 because the height of my performance view or my background should be 300. So let's see what happens there because something funny is gonna happen. Let's hit apply. All right, you can see that this space has now actually grown. And if we'd open the spanner again, here is our background. We can now see all of it this way, but there's this black bit underneath. If you were paying attention earlier, you know that I said that the header of the instrument, where all the sort of instrument details and the spanner icon is, that is 68 pixels high. So when you type in 300 pixels, it's already taken out the 68 from your background. So you're actually doing 68 more than you need. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come into the spanner and I'm gonna just adjust that value to 232. So taking away 68 pixels for the header and hit apply. You can see that shrink there. And when I go over, that's now the right size. So that's 68 for the header plus 232 
which in total makes the 300. Just something to be aware of and to remember. Okay, when we come over to the spanner again, now we want to set the width because if I actually look at this, we, we can't even see the full instrument at the moment. So let's dive in and we're gonna do something very similar. I'm gonna enter tab over, set underscore UI underscore width now, underscore pixels. We're gonna set this to a thousand. Now the great thing is here, we don't have to account for any kind of headers or bars or toolbars or anything like that. So we know that our graphic for our background was a thousand pixels. So let's hit apply and spanner over. Now you can see the window has grown. It's now showing us everything that is in our background. This is our full background. But when we go back into the spanner, there's not really much that's changed in here. And the reason nothing has really changed in here is that this UI or this interface for building the instrument is always 580 pixels wide. So you can't change that. That means later on when you see controls that start to turn up in this space, if they're past 580 pixels, they're gonna appear off screen and you'll have to go over to the spanner to have a look at these later on. So that's just something to bear in mind. Okay, so with that, we have created a performance view. We've set the height and the width for that performance view. And in our instrument options, we have added in our background. So now we can see a background, we can see a performance view, and it's ready for some controls. It's really powerful to add one of these to your instrument, and it would be really fantastic if you start to explore this part of the instrument creation. It does take a little bit to get used to, but you can see that a small amount of code can start to make things work in no time. And throughout this chapter, you'll have all the skills you need to just get the basics up and running. Of course, don't forget to save your instrument. Make sure you jump into the spanner up to the top and hit save edited instrument. And if you want to, you can save the next version. So I'm gonna put version three there and I'm just gonna save it as patch only. I don't need absolute sample paths and hit save. For more on saving, look back at chapter two in the first episode. Okay, there we have it. We've created our performance view, we've started our scripting adventure, and we've added in a background. In the next video, we're going to actually start adding some controls to this background. So it's going to be super exciting. You're definitely going to want to subscribe so you get notified for that. Ding the bell as well. But we'll be adding our first slider and controlling the volume of our first group. Until I see you there, I'll catch you in the next one.